And he's like, hey, Ben, uh, what do you think about this idea of writing a space newsletter? I, I've been wanting to do it for a little while, and do you think I should do it? And I was like, that is a terrible idea. <laughs> Unless you have a co-editor. And by saying that, I immediately had volunteered myself to be the co-editor. When I was a bit younger, in my 20s, it was always just the same question, which was, how cool does that, this make me look, right? <laughs> Living in the Bay Area when I was in my 20s, I thought it would make me look exceptionally cool. Frames of reference are all about measuring things. They consist of an observer and then a coordinate system. Um, and what I've realized is that most of our choices in life are also about measuring things, right? Go to a dark place, look up in the sky, and see it kind of zipping along. And think about, you know, frames of reference and how they impact how you see the world. I'm really excited to see this many people out on a very, very gray, rainy Friday morning here in Cleveland. Um, so my name is Ben. Uh, first of all, thanks to Great Culture. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak to this morning. Uh, and even more, thank you to Land for hosting. This is a really cool space. And it's been a process, I know, because I've been a little bit, you know, jumped into it uh, time to time. Um, so I am going to talk about gravity. I'm going to talk about some nerdy space stuff. Um, but First of all, I want to give you a little bit of like my story um, to kind of put that in context. So I uh, grew up in a very entrepreneurial like, kind of household. My dad was a wooden toy maker, and my mom was a piano teacher. Um, so as a technologist, I am the black sheep of the family. Um, but uh, in you know in high school, I kind of I came to the internet and. I you know, discovered this thing called technology. Um, and I started building websites, and then I started building apps. And as a graduating senior in high school, I built my, and released my first app um, to the public. And a couple months later, a few hundred thousand people had downloaded it, and a company came to me and said they wanted to buy it. And I was like, this is amazing. Um, I should do this forever. Um, <laughs> So I went to college. Um, I worked for Apple through college uh, as part of the higher ed sales team. Um, and I was firmly on the trajectory to move to Cupertino and work for Apple corporate. Um, however, I took a kind of a gap year and I did volunteer work in Southeast Asia, um, first in Myanmar and then Thailand. And when I got back, a couple things happened. Um, I kind of got back into the, the track of, you know, Apple had recruited me. Um, I was going through the, you know, the corporate interview uh, process. Um, and then my father um, got diagnosed with colon cancer. He was 60, um, and he was in the middle of building himself a, a house for my parents to retire into. And so I was young, I was unemployed, and I said, hey, how about I finish building this thing? Um, and so with my friends, my family, and my community, I finished building my parents' house. And uh, it is amazing that it is still standing today. It has not fallen on anyone or killed anyone. And my parents are happily living in it. My dad is a reasonably healthy 77-year-old. You know, he might not get out and uh, you know, get enough exercise, but he's still here. Um, and by the time I had finished building that house um, with you know, my community uh, supporting me, um, it had taken a little bit longer than I'd optimistically thought. And uh, th some things, some variables about my life had changed. Uh, my wife and I had had our first kid, and I had started a business. Um, and it was a Mac software business. So I was no longer kind of on that trajectory to go to you know, Cupertino and work for Apple. Um, but I did stay involved and connected to the, to the San Francisco scene pretty deeply. Um, and that Mac software company, we made cooking software. Um, and through that experience, we were pretty successful. Um, I realized that just because I loved cooking and I loved software did not make me want to be the cooking software guy for the rest of my life. Um, so I did, I eventually sold it to a, a, a UK-based developer um, and started a, nex a next company. Um, this company was called Nice Mohawk. Um, and it was with a previous employee of mine and a friend from college um, whose name is Bob Cantoni, and he's actually a Cleveland native. Um, 
So we were Athens, Ohio, and Cleveland for a while. Um, we did a bunch of work mostly on the West Coast with early stage startups in the mobile space. Um, and uh, after several years of doing that, I realized that I had been really interested in energy for a long time. I had put solar panels on my house, I'd gotten a heat pump, I'd done all the things. And I felt like that I had kind of hit a wall as far as personal impact uh, in related to energy and climate change. And so I really felt like I needed to pivot my professional life to match kind of my personal interests. And so I started a startup. Um, my business partner at Nice Mohawk went to one of our clients in San Francisco, and I had met this guy that was a fabulous uh, hardware engineer who was also kind of coming back from San Francisco and made, moved you know, kind of back to Ohio. He'd been pulled back. Um, and so we had a startup, we went through some fundraising, um, we went through an M&A process, and that acquisition cratered the day that we were supposed to uh, sign it. This is, this is the life of a startup. Um, I learned a lot. Um, and in the past four years since that, I've gotten to work on a couple other cool things. Um, first of all, I got to work on the first Harley Davidson electric motorcycle. Not as cool as Land's motorcycle, I will say. Um, then I got to work with Twitter, one of the founders there, and um, the C-suite to kind of do a Skunk Works product build. Um, and most recently, we did a big project with Honeywell, um, building safety systems uh, and sensing systems for really large kind of power plant size uh, lithium ion batteries. Lots of cool stuff. That brings me to kind of now-ish. And I'm here to talk about gravity, not about that stuff. So let's start with gravity on the International Space Station. Um, We've all seen videos of kind of astronauts floating around. Um, put yourself in you know, astronaut mode. See if you can imagine being an astronaut on the space station. The space station is stable around you. It's kind of your environment, and it is not moving. However, if you download the NASA app on your phone, um, and you look for the next overpass, the next time that the, the ISS is, is, is floating overhead, um, and you go out in a dark space and you look up, and you just see this thing like trucking across the sky. It takes about four minutes to go from horizon to horizon. Um, and it's moving at eight kilometers per second. Does anyone know what the actual gravity is on the space station? Anybody? It's 88.5% of the gravity on Earth. Yet, those astronauts are floating around and they talk about being in zero gravity or microgravity. Uh, this is because they're actually free falling around the Earth, and so they're always in free fall. The gravity is actually fairly similar, but you know uh, the context is very different. Um, what this tells us is that, like, when we think about things like speed and distance, um, gravity, mass, um, your perspective really matters a ton. Um, and this is, uh, within physics, it's called a frame of reference. So let's change our frame of reference one more time. Um, we go to the surface of the sun, and in the m brief moment before we're vaporized, uh, we look at the Earth and we say, how fast is the Earth moving? Right now, it feels like we're standing here and we're not moving at all, right? But the Earth is moving at about 30 kilometers per second, right? So in a whole order of magnitude, faster than the ISS. Let's do one last frame of reference move. Um, and this time we're moving to the galactic core of the Milky Way. We look out into the, you know, the spiral arm of the galaxy and we say, how fast is the, the solar system moving? Um, and it turns out that it's an almost unimaginable speed of about 200 to 220 kilometers per second. So frames of reference are all about measuring things. They consist of an observer and then a coordinate system. Um, and what I've realized is that most of our choices in life are also about measuring things, right? Um, you know, how happy will it make me if I eat this big burger? Um, if I move to Ohio City, how long will my commute be, right? Um, how much time can I spend vacationing before my boss, uh, Rick, right over here, um, <laughs> notices? Um, it turns out it's about a month in Europe. <laughs> Um, and the kind of age-old measuring myself versus other people of how successful am I, right? Um, when I was a bit younger, in my 20s, it was always just 
the same question, which was, how cool does that, this make me look, right? <laughs> um, when we add time to that coordinate system, right, we add a, a, another axis, um, and that's going to be time, um, it actually makes things even more interesting, right? So living in the Bay Area when I was in my 20s, I thought it would make me look exceptionally cool. Living in Ohio, not so much. Um, but you fast forward to the middle of COVID, and you know, living in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains with lots of natural beauty around me and lots of particularly space, um, it kind of seemed like a master stroke, right? Uh, compared to living in the San Francisco Mission or Manhattan, right, at the time. So one of the other things that I may not have thought looked quite so cool when I was in my 20s um, is writing a space newsletter. Um, but I do write a weekly space newsletter. It is called the Orbital Index. Um, and at this point, we have over 7,500 readers, um, which include people like NASA mission leads, um, you know, founders at really cool space tech startups, um, incredible engineers, and like legit astrophysicists. Um, all of these are things I am not, and people that I would classify as way smarter than myself. I never really thought I would write much of anything, and I'm sure that none of my teachers or any of my family would ever have chosen me to be the guy that's writing things. Um, in fact, uh, some of my old security questions were like, what do you hate the most you know, in school? It was always writing. Um, so how did I end up like, writing a space newsletter, right? Um, well, like, one day I was talking with my very oldest friend, um, somebody I'd known since I was three. Uh, we were having a conversation, and he's like, hey, Ben, uh, what do you think about this idea of writing a space newsletter? I, I've been wanting to do it for a little while, and do you think I should do it? And I was like, that is a terrible idea. Unless you have a co-editor. And by saying that, I immediately had volunteered myself to be the co-editor. And it turns out that when you write about something consistently and you really strive for excellence and you're passionate about it, um, that you learn a ton. So I've learned a lot about space over the last five years. That, that conversation will be five years ago in February. Um, this past week, I wrote about this new telescope um, that the, just came online. It's from the European Space Agency, um, and it's called Euclid. Um, it's named after the father of geometry, kind of the first person that you know, actually thought about those coordinate systems that uh, you know, are really key to frames of reference. Um, Euclid is a sky survey telescope. So we all know about Hubble and maybe more recently like James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and we know about them because they're really good at looking very specific things. And when you do that, you get a really nice picture, right? Um, we've all seen those like amazing pictures of nebula and stuff. Um, but Euclid is good at imaging big chunks of the sky. So over the next six years, it's going to you know, image about a third of the sky outside of the Milky Way. Um, and it's going to build a map of the structure of the universe out to about 10 billion light years away. Um, pretty sick, right? Um, so Euclid is sitting about 1.5 million kilometers outside of the orbit of Earth. And one thing, um, and it's like sitting at this place called a Lagrange point. Uh, Lagrange points are really interesting because they're a place where t the uh, two celestial bodies, their gravity actually balances and they create a, a point of equilibrium. The easiest one to conceptualize is actually this thing called L1, it's Lagrange point one, there are five of them, um, and it's inside of the orbit of Earth. It's between the Sun and the Earth, where the gravity of the Sun is balanced by the gravity of Earth. As you can imagine, given the size difference, it's pretty close to Earth. L2 is on the other side, um, which is where Euclid is. Uh, one thing to rem remember here is that um, objects that are uh, orbiting in the same period, right? So Earth's period is one year. Um, if they are farther out, they have more distance to cover and therefore they're moving faster. And if they're inside of the orbit, closer to the sun, they're moving slower actually. So if you have something, say a, t a space telescope, and you launch it and it's going the same speed as Earth, and then you move it out 1.5 mil million kilometers, it's actually going to be going you know, it's going to take longer to go around, and therefore it's going to fall behind Earth. So it's, you know, as, as time goes past, it's going to get farther and farther and farther away until it's on the opposite side of the solar system, and you can't get any pictures back from it because the sun's in the middle. Um, so, what do you do? Well, you use a Lagrange point. 
And uh, L2 is where the gravity of Earth and the sun combine, as opposed to you know, uh, equaling each other out, to actually pull that point in space along faster so that it matches Earth. So this is where Euclid is. Um, and these kinds of points of equilibrium are really interesting. They're good for a couple things. One is you know, observing, which is you know, like, because they're stable, right? You're always looking out into the, you know, the end of the universe. The second is um, they're really good at changing courses. So you don't have any forces acting on you. So you'll often see a trajectory of a spacecraft go through a Lagrange point and then you know, make an adjustment because it's easy to do it at that point in time. And the third thing is they're just good for hanging out. That's what Euclid is doing. Um, so yeah, right now I kind of see myself approaching one of these equilibrium points. Um, I've done a bunch of different things in my life. Um, and I've had the exceptionally nice opportunity of working with Bright for the past couple years. Um, and companies like Land and Leaf and Energy Deals and a bunch of others that are in the audience today. Um, but I'm doing a bunch of measuring, right? I'm thinking about how much change can a person actually expect to, you know, impact uh, uh, have on the world, right? Um, should I attempt from here on out to like build something or should I do something that's more leverage, high leverage, like invest in ideas and projects of other people? Um, do I wanna do work where I can measure the change every day or do I wanna work kind of at a more macro level, level where I'm maybe you know, trying to change bigger concepts or bigger ideas or bigger problems? I don't really have all the answers yet um, and so I think I'm just gonna hang out for a little bit at this point of equilibrium. Um, but I do know that I have a bunch of things that are kind of pulling at me. Um, and, you know, I, the, the one that's really, you know, kind of the biggest is that I, I really do kind of desire to continue to work within climate change and solving, you know, kind of the biggest problem that humanity has ever created. It feels like the problem of our generation to work on. So, to wrap this all up, I want you all to go out, download that NASA app, uh, look at the next time that the ISS is going to go across, right? Go to a dark place, look up in the sky, and see it kind of zipping along. And think about, you know, frames of reference and how they impact how you see the world. If that feels like too much work and the sky clears up, uh, you can just go out, out tonight. Uh, tonight is the Leonids uh, meteor shower. Uh, and it'll be peaking between midnight and uh, sunrise. So just go outside to a dark place, you know, look up, see some meteors. They're super cool and very fun. Um, yeah, and just be kind of amazed by the universe. So thank you so much. Um, and I'm happy to have some questions if there are questions.